All right, what we're going to do, um, again, we'll, we'll see how far we get today. Um, three things we're going to look at uh, today. We're going to start looking at today, and we'll see if we get through all of them or not. The one thing we're going to look at is slightly a different style of coding the PHP. If you remember last time, we did a table in PHP, and we essentially did this. If I can... We went into PHP, we had a bunch of PHP instructions, and then periodically we had an echo to output some chunk of HTML. So we had some HTML, we went in, and then we had one big block of PHP, and that outputted all our HTML. And that's one way you can do it, and that's a perfectly fine way to do it. Uh, I'm going to show you sort of a, a, an alternative to doing it that way that involves jumping in and out of PHP frequently instead of going into PHP. So in other words, we're going to do more in plain old HTML and less in PHP. All right? Um, I don't see a significant difference between doing it one way or the other. Um, I don't, you know, whether one way makes a server work slightly harder or not is a moot point in my mind. It's not going to be a huge difference either way. The big difference in my mind is readability. Do what you think makes it more readable. So I show you these examples because, again, from time to time you may be looking at someone else's code and they may do it a different way and I don't want it to throw you completely. So you can pick a way that you want to do it that works for you and that's great. But you should be exposed to that. So that's one thing we're going to do. Where we're going to pop in and out of PHP more often. Second thing we're going to do is we're going to look about putting things in functions. All right, Functions and we'll, we'll review about why we're going to do that. And then the last thing we're going to do is we're going to talk about putting things in include files. And include files in PHP are similar to like an external CSS file uh, in HTML. That is, we can create a file, we can put it out there, and then we can reuse that file from page to page. So, for example, if you can imagine us being a, a, a store that was international, and we had a bunch of pages that had prices on it, um, but based on maybe who the user was and where the user was from, we might want to convert prices on the page, on every single page, to their particular currency. Well, by putting it in an include file, we can take our code, wrap it up, sort of make a little package for it, create our functions, and then we can call it wherever we need it. All right? So, let's bring up the example we had from last time. Let's first of all look at the example we had from last time to refresh our memory. Again, not to beat a dead horse, we talked about this before, given that these are PHP files, we can no longer simply like double click them and run them. We have to request them from a web server because a web server does the processing and takes the PHP code and actually transforms it into a completed web page. So. I took the files that we had from last time and I put them in my web server's root, which on my particular machine, on this particular machine, is C uh, inetpub www root. I can now request them from the server by typing in localhost slash and then the name of the page, which the form page is form.html. Even though that's just a uh, an HTML page. I still have to request it from the server because the action of the form is a PHP page. So that's the only way you can use PHP if you, um, did you say call it from the root or? Well, well, you don't have to put
put it, it, it you can put it anywhere uh, within the web server's files, but you do have to request it. You can't simply like double click it, um, like like here. Like you can't like if this was a um, you know in, in previous examples we could go and double click this. Yeah, enter it in. There we get our code, because we did not run this through a web server. And the reason I know we didn't run this in the web server, two reasons. One is you see it says file, blah, 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 blah. So it didn't run it through a particular web server. And secondly, I, I'm getting my PHP code. So again, remember, browsers don't understand PHP. Browsers understand HTML. So the HTML has to be transformed by the server into um, PHP. So now if I go in, and now I requested it by putting in the name of the server slash form.html, I can pick this, and I click convert, and there I have my answer, and it worked just fine. All right, now looking at something. See, we have a big old block of HTML. All right. I'm going to keep this as it was, and I'm going to clone this guy. I'm going to change it to process. Then I'll change my form to call process2. That way I'll just, I'll have two versions of the PHP code. All right. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to, where it says echo, I'm going to, all that's doing is sending out plain old HTML. So where it says echo, instead of staying in PHP for that, I'm going to go and simply pop out and have the HTML code. Now, anywhere that I have a PHP instruction, anywhere where I'm not putting plain HTML, I have to go back into PHP mode for that. about this, and here's what makes this sometimes a little bit hard to read. If you notice this if statement here, we go in and out of PHP twice for it. We go into PHP to start the if statement. We leave PHP to output our HTML, then we go back into PHP simply to close the if statement. All right. If you're not careful, that can make the code kind of hard to read. But again, this is largely a matter of personal preference. So let's go. Do the same sort of thing here.
Now, one reason my, why you might want to do this, and I thought of doing this example this way, but I didn't. Maybe when we have another example, I'll do it this way, is think of what you could do if you're working with a team of developers. All right. As you know, programming uh, web pages, creating web pages, has sort of two aspects to it. It has the visual aspect, and it has the um, programming or coding aspect, the, the, the technical side. If you're working on a team, and you had someone who was very skilled in design, but was not quite as good of a programmer, and then the flip side, if you had someone who is a great programmer, but maybe not quite as strong on design, you could actually work as a team. And this is how I worked on a lot of projects when I was a consultant. We would have designers make, mock up an HTML page, all right? In other words, they would go in and they would hard code a table. Like in this case, we're converting a dollar amount and that dollar amount changes based on what the user typed in. Well, they would just go and like hard code like $100 and then put in all the rows of the table, all the data in the table. And then they would use all their design tricks to get the page to look exactly perfect, museum quality, lovely, beautiful page. All right? Then they would give it to the programmers. And the programmers would do pretty much what I'm doing here. They would take and they would replace the hard-coded values that were mocked up in the prototype with actual calculations using PHP that could involve database queries or calculations or whatever. So in that way you can sort of leverage the two skill sets. Someone could develop a plain old HTML sort of template for that and then a programmer can go in and fill in the parts that's dynamic, that are dynamic, all right, with the proper PHP code to do the calculations. So. I could have went and I could have created a table and just mocked up some results and then go back and replace it with PHP. So that's a, that, was a, that was a real common mode that I worked in. Um, and again, if you're on a larger project where you have more of a clean separation of duties, all right, you might, you're, you're likely to work in that so, uh, sort of mode where one person's responsible for the look, the other person's responsible for the coding. Of course, on a smaller project, or if you're doing everything yourself, then you sort of wear both hats, and then you can sort of decide what um, approach you're going to take. So really what I'm doing is I'm going in and Yes, there is. That is one advantage of using these fancy newfangled editors like Notepad++ is you could tell that probably without even like yeah. looking too closely because the coloring of that doesn't match up. Yeah. So now that, that goes and that does match up. And this is in the wrong place. sort of mix and match, too. I could leave it like this. I'll do one row one way and one row. Or one TD one way and one TD another. Like this one, I'm going in and I'm creating the TD. I'm popping into PHP to echo the dollars. Then I'm going to close my TD. And because I am getting tired of typing, and I think you get the idea, I'm going 
going to go and just leave all that in a block of PHP. So it's not like you have to, to, to choose one way of doing it. You know, you can mix and match. <coughs> now, the only thing I will say about this is this can be very tricky to read. Because if you look, way up here we have an if statement that gets started. All right? That if statement is not closed until down here. And in between, we've popped in and out of PHP like a half dozen times. All right? Again, Everything should work just as it did before. All right. All right. And if we look at, if we do a view source, again, we're just going to see the HTML. does sort of look funky just like it did before. All right. I lied. There's another thing I want to talk about. Errors in PHP. All right. Um, there are settings that determine how errors are reported in PHP. When you are developing uh, an application, you probably want to see all the errors possible because you want to see if something went wrong. When you've deployed the application, when you've put it up on the web, sometimes error messages can give hackers clues as to something about your system. So you may want to suppress error messages in that case or report the errors differently. So let me go and let me make a mistake on this. I assume that's not a PHP command. That'd be wild if it was. Like a treasure map would pop up that was buried by the creator of PHP. This sounds like a, a Nicolas Cage movie. <laughs> All right. So let's go and save it, I, which I did. All right. We get nothing. All right. Well, that is really hard to debug when you don't get anything. You know, it's like the patient going to the doctor and saying, I'm sick. You know, well, gee, can you give me a little information? You know, what, what hurts? You know, where, where's the problem? So, what I'm going to do is I'm going to try to find the file that controls this, and it's called a PHP any file. Any, I believe, would stand for initialization. And here it is. And where 
has the option to just like leave me alone. All right, there we go. And if we look here and scroll down, this is a reference. All right. And this shows what errors that you can show and so on and so forth. So let's find error handling and logging. sort of repeats what I said. The direct, this directive controls whether or not and where PHP will output errors, notices, and warnings. Error output is very useful during development, but it could be dangerous in a production environment. So if we scroll down here, notice display errors is set to off, all right, which is why it blew up, but we didn't see anything. Let me go and change that to on. And of course I can't save it. So let me go and save it to the desktop and copy it over. like it is in programs files so on your machine you would not have issues like this. It's just the way that this, these machines are set up. Now, all right, there we get an error message that first glance doesn't look any better than getting no error message, right? Parse error, syntax error, expected if, t if in ci net pub, blah, 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 at line 16. Well, at least we have an idea of where to start looking, all right? So I can go in here and see line 16 is where the problem is. And, oh, I'm sorry, I misread that. Unexpected if, not expected if. All right. Um, that makes a little more sense. In other words, it sees this if statement and sort of smack dab in the sea of garbage, it sees the word if. And it doesn't really know what's going on, but it knows that it doesn't make sense to have the word if here. So the moral of the story is sometimes the error message will be like around where the error is and not precisely where the error is. So in this case, the problem isn't with line 16, but the problem is with line 15. So 
we'll go and remove that, and then we'll be back in business. Or not. Are there any advantages of having the error message on? Having the error message on or the error message off? Um, I mean, even though it's kind of vague. Uh, yeah, it, 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 at least it like gives you an idea of of where the the error might be. So yeah, it is definitely to your advantage to have the error messages um, turned on. Line thirty So it's definitely to your advantage while you're developing to have the error message turned on. Because again, it, it's like, you know, you have to, you have to play detective then. Um, it, it tells you sort of around where the problem is or where it noticed it. Being able to sort of look at an error message and look at your code and figuring out what it's telling you is something that only comes with practice. But at the very least, if you remember before, we had no error message. It's kind of like, all right, well, where's the problem among these 87 lines of code? All right, I don't know. At least, in that case, it told me there was an error around line 16. So I was like, okay, well, I don't have to look at 87 lines of code. I can just look around line 16 and figure it out. So definitely as you're developing it, it's to your advantage. Yes? How did you get it? access to that any file again? Uh, well, I just did a search to find out exactly where it is. Okay. All right. And again, depending on your operating system, open file location. And it shows me where the file is stored, which is C program files x86 PHP v5.5. And then on your machine, because you're probably the administrator, you could just go in and straight up edit it. On the machine here, because of security reasons, I had to edit it, save it to the desktop, and then copy it back over. It is a good idea, which I did not do. It's a good idea to make a backup of this before you make changes to it. Because if you break this, PHP will stop working, period. And um, it's nice to be able to just say, oh, I messed something up. Let me just go back to the backup and, and take another shot, all right, instead of trying to, to look through or whatever. You know, if your cat jumped on the keyboard when you weren't looking and put some extra characters in or, or whatever. That doesn't happen, that, 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 that may happen to me, but it almost never does because my cats are never awake. They are always, and I, I was commenting this over the weekend, I have three cats, I have a average size house, dozen rooms, and yet I'm sitting here and all three of them are like sleeping around me, like constantly. And it's like, they don't move. I mean, I, I got to envy them for that, you know. Um, but anyhow, yes, it, 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 you know, maybe when they were younger and kittens and were a little more active, they would, they would jump on the keyboard and, and do that. All right. So that's two of the things I wanted to talk about. The next thing I want to talk about is functions. All right. And we're going to do this in two steps. Functions and any files sort of go hand in hand. Because the idea is, is that if you look at this block of code, oops, my conversion here is like buried in the middle of this page. 
as I mentioned before, it, it could very well be that this would be a calculation that I would want to have repeated throughout my site. You know, there might be any number of different pages where I would want to do this sort of currency conversion. So I would want it repeated from page to page. There's all kinds of advantages to that. For one is if I make a mistake in the calculation or if something in the calculation changes, there's only one place I have to make the change. So let's think about, you know, besides currency conversion, there could be something like calculating shipping cost, right? Calculating shipping costs can be complicated, right? Like if you go to Amazon, you know, if you have more than $25, you get free two-day shipping. Otherwise, you can ask for overnight shipping. Otherwise, you know, there's a, like a whole complicated list of rules in that. Um, I actually, ages ago, worked on an application that involves shipping stuff overseas. And that was really complicated, all right? And as it turned out, it was like um, chemicals for like research scientific companies. And some of them were potentially hazardous, and there's all kinds of regulations about what could be shipped where and how much it would cost and all that. We actually had one person out of a three or four person team whose job was just to work on the shipping calculation. Like everyone else did everything else, <laughs> you know, and that one tiny little piece that person worked on because it really wasn't a tiny little piece. Well, if you think about that, that's not something you're going to want to do twice, all right? And that's not something that if it changes, you're going to have to go back and put it in in several places. You want these complicated or even simple calculations put in one place so that you only have to get it right once. And if something about this were to change, you could just go in and change it. Now, in this particular case, I have hard-coded the, the conversion rate, all right? In real life, that conversion rate changes from day to day, probably from hour to hour, all right? So in real life, the function would probably run out to a database somewhere or use some sort of service to get the amount. But even with our hard-coded one, we can demonstrate and talk about the value of functions. So how do you make a function in PHP? Well, I'm going to put my function at the very bottom of the page. You don't have to, but it seems like a good place to put it in for me. Why? Because a function isn't going to output anything. Actually, even if it did output something, we could, we could still put it there. Because it's going to output, it's going to do its thing when it gets called, not based on its position. And, similar to JavaScript, we're going to have the word function. We're going to give it a name. And then we're going to have the argument. All right. What is the argument? The argument is the value that we want to operate on. All right. The value that we want to do something to. So in this case, convert to yen, our argument is arg dollars, all right? By convention, I put arg in front of arguments. That just helps me keep straight what's an argument and what isn't. Now, that's a placeholder because we can call this function from many places within our code or even from many pages even from many pages. So, all right, um, but I do know that to convert to yen, I need to know what dollar amount we're talking about. So the arguments are the information that the function needs to do its job. 
And however many arguments it needs, you can, you can have. So for example, this one just takes one uh, argument. And in fact, I'm going to make the name even a little more precise, convert dollars to yen. And to do that, what do you need? Well, you need the dollars, how many dollars it is. Think of it as if you were asking a person a question. Let's say you, you, um, you, know, you were in a bank and you went up to the teller and you said, you, you, know, you, you're, you, you landed in Tokyo for spring break next week. All right, well, that would be nice, wouldn't it? And you go up and you want to exchange some money and you say, okay, I want some yen. How many yen do I get? Well, what's the bank teller going to say? They're going to say, well, how many dollars you got? All right. So if I say, well, I want to exchange $200, they'll say $200 equals whatever amount of yen. All right. So that's the input. And in the case of this, there's just one argument, right? If I'm converting dollars to yen, all I need to know is the dollars. All right. Now the conversion rate and all that, that's part of this function. In our example, we're gonna hard code it, but we could look it up in a database or something else. If I was calculating tuition, all right, tuition here at LC, how many arguments would my function require? You have to calculate your tuition next semester. What arguments do you need? How many credit hours you're taking, and what else? Um, if you're in county, I'm right. County. What your residency status is. If you know your residency status and you know your tuition, uh, or I'm sorry, the, the credit hours, you can calculate the tuition. And again, I like to think about it like if you went to the cashier's office and you said, hey, I want to know what my tuition is, they're going to ask you those two things. Well, how many credit hours are you taking? Well, are you in-county resident, out-of-county, or out-of-state? So those values that you have to supply are called arguments to the function. Functions can return a value. And you can think of that value as being the answer to the question. In other words, in the case of convert dollars to yen, the answer to this, the return value, is going to be the number of yen that corresponds to this number of dollars. In the case of tuition, the, the answer is going to be what your total tuition amount is in dollars. A function can take many arguments. If I want to figure out how much liquid I could put in a barrel, right, I need to know um, the height of the barrel, the diameter of the barrel going across. I thought there was going to be three things in that case, but that's right, there's only two. And then the answer is going to be how many ounces or gallons or whatever that it would take. Let's say if I'm talking about filling up an aquarium, all right? If I knew how, I might, I need to know how high it was, how long it was, and how wide it was to know how many gallons the aquarium is going to be, all right? So I need, I can give it three arguments. But I'm always from a function going to get back one answer. All right. So what was our formula for this? It was $0.9. No. 119.56. See, that's what I should do. I should go to Japan and feel like I'm rich. It's like instead of having $10 to my name, I'd have 1,000 yen to my name. Just go down to Mexico, save yourself a <laughs> Okay, so we got a late start today, so I'm going to go a little bit longer. I do want to finish this piece of it. And it'll be pretty, 
once we once we get this one down, it, it's pretty easy to see how the other ones would work. Did you um, call your argument dollars at like a later point? Well, that's a good question. I haven't done that step yet. Oh, okay. All right. This is just a placeholder. Oh, okay. Remember that I could call this function eventually. I could call this function from a bunch of different places. In fact, when I put it in an include file, I could call this function from a whole bunch of different pages. On one page, it could be called dollars, the variable. On another page, it be, could be called dollar sign DOL. On another page, it could be called bucks, whatever. All right. So whatever is called on the individual page, we're going to call it within the function arg dollars. So what I need to do when I call this function, I say yen equals, I'm going to call my function, which is called convert dollars to yen. And we're going to pass in the variable <coughs> where we're getting the dollars from. And in this case, it's from the variable dollars. So if you call it something else like on a different mm -hmm. page, how does it know though? Like well, if I if if let's say I let's pretend this is a different page down here. And it was box <laughs> equals ten. And I could do yen equals convert dollars to yen, and I put in bucks. So what that says is when I call this function, put in the value of whatever's in that variable. So when I call it then, that time, whatever value was in bucks would get put in that. And then I do the rest of the calculation. We'll see more examples of this next time. I just want to make sure this piece works. Um, and let me do the other two just to finish up. Oh. And then after I do the calculation, I return the answer. What happens to the return value? The return value gets stuffed in whatever variable this is called. All right. So arguments are where you give it input. This is the input I'm giving. The return value is where we give the answer, and something else can, and the, and the page can do whatever it needs to with that. dollars to pounds. For this one page, this isn't a huge advantage. It will become an advantage as we reuse this code on other pages, or even reuse this code elsewhere on this page. So now if I save this, everything should work the same as it did before. All right, but the difference is, is I'm calling these functions. So key thing to the function, the name of the function, the arguments where we're sort of filling in the blanks of the function. This is what we're going to do the calculation on, and then the return value is the result that we're putting in. 
Now again, notice this name and this name doesn't match up with the names in my the rest of the page. It doesn't have to. That's what makes a function reusable. So whatever value I plug in here gets plugged into our dollars. I'm returning the variable result. We can do whatever we want to with that result. We can store it in a variable called euros or yen or pounds or whatever. Questions on this? Our next step, next time, will be to take these functions and a few other things and put them in an include file. Once we put this in an include file, we could actually do a whole bunch of stuff with this. And we could, for example, make a chart that went from one to a thousand dollars and showed how many pounds, euros, yen, and so on. All right? So that's where we'll pick up on 